Hey guys, it's Abel here with the Sustainable Cell Development Podcast. And in this episode, I have my very respected colleague, Steve Hall from revivestronger.com on to talk about something that is, of course, very near and dear to everyone's heart, especially now that the beach season is rapidly approaching and that is quick fat loss. And within that, a method that is known in the bodybuilding circles as mini cutting, which is basically a short and rapid version of a fat loss diet. So the topic we're going to talk about today is how to lose fat quickly and efficiently. What's the fastest way that someone should try to get rid of that extra pudge if they don't want to lose a whole bunch of muscle or have super low energy levels. And we will discuss the theory and the science behind it, but we'll also give you guys some practical tips on hunger management, recipes you can try if you try something like this and we will also answer some of the questions that were sent to us on Facebook so cool discussion here also at the end we talked about the seminar that Steve is organizing in the UK which will host the one and only Dr. Mike Isratel, with whom I've done three amazing episodes on my podcast, and he is an absolute legend in the field. So I highly recommend that you check out Steve's announcements on that event. And I believe at this point in time, so April 2017, you can already purchase the tickets to that event. So that's pretty much what I had to say for this intro, and I hope you will enjoy this episode with Steve. So let's get into it. Hey, Steve, how is it going, man? I'm very well about. Thank you for having me on again. Um, yeah, apart from this slight back niggle, I am kind of, I think, seven weeks into my contest prep or the first half of my contest prep. Feeling pretty good about how things are going. So, yeah, good. Yeah, cool. So um, do you know how much longer you have to go from actually getting on stage? See, yeah, my shows actually aren't until uh, September. So I've got ages. Uh, and what's likely to happen and why I said kind of my first half of contest prep is I may well have a very short kind of increase in calories, even kind of gain some weight, maintain for a period of time and then kind of enter in like a digging phase or like a, a part two of contest prep. So um, mm-hmm. that's kind of yeah, where I'm at at the moment. Yeah, no, that will be very interesting. And you might actually find out, uh, just like Alberto Nunez, that you actually have a lower settling point that you previously realized if you increase your calories while trying to stay as lean as you are or close to it. Yeah, I mean, it will be like, I mean, maintenance periods are like diet breaks and things like that, great for reversing kind of all the metabolic kind of fatigue and the diet fatigue that takes place. But actually going into a surplus will be kind of big time repairing it. So the second half of the diet should be a lot easier. But I think you're right. I think especially since doing the contest and then remaining a bit leaner uh, to that contest weight, I've managed to kind of bring, if I did bring my settling point down, um, I think I probably have. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, so as just for people who haven't seen recent pictures or videos of you, you're you're very lean. We just talked about that you're probably hanging around at maybe 8% or maybe slightly lower. And I've seen that you put up a little kind of chart or if, like giving yourself certain scores for certain markers like hunger and energy and things like that, like four out of five or things like that. Uh, if we were to score your degree of thinking about food and fantasizing about food how how much that would score on a scale of five? Ooh, um so five being bad yeah like yeah yeah like one not thinking about food at all five is thinking about it all the time and dreaming about it and whatever i'd probably go over three um because i'm definitely no i'm nowhere near a five but um definitely kind of i am at times like what time is it when's my next meal (laughs) coming around yeah and i am like planning i guess i I plan more a lot more when i'm dieting just kind of like volume foods make my oats slow cooking them having those prepared for kind of certain meals but yeah probably a three not too bad it's really not that bad yet cool yeah um that, that that's a good sign because and i just talked about this with with someone on a recent podcast that Um, When you're dieting, uh, like one hour before a meal can seem so long that like most people would not believe like, dude, like, can you really not wait for another hour? But when you're like deep into a diet, that can seem endlessly long. Like, is this ever going to pass? But yeah. Um, Yeah, actually, I'm surprised to hear. So oats work for you as a diet food? Oh, I love oats. They're probably my main carbohydrate source along with like vegetables. 
um, because I just cook them and then cook them and then leave them to soak in and they can almost kind of trip in volume if you get kind of kind of work well with them but yeah I find it interesting because um, something like a white potato a lot of people find that that's kind of that really helps them and it's high on the satiety index but for me white potato does nothing um, I'm actually better with like yeah, white rice which is kind of really low on the satiety index but for me yeah. it just fills me up better interesting interesting so yeah for me for me white rice and oats are like almost kryptonite foods like find it so easy to overeat on them it's really weird but um all right man so um we are going to talk about a topic which is very near and dear to a lot of people's hearts and uh just as the beach season is coming up and it's slowly getting warmer and warmer many people will want to get lean and if possible they want to get lean fast which is something that you are you have become an expert on because you you have guided through a lot of people uh through these mini cuts as we call them right so um mini cutting is basically our topic today and i'm excited to have to be able to pick your brain on it so just for people who may be new to the topic which is probably not a lot of people at this point who are listening to this but you know, just in case, how would you define uh, a mini cut and how is it different from a more traditional, slower, longer diet? So I think for me, a mini cut has to be mini. So a lot of people will try and kind of, they might put mini, mini cuts back to back and call that a mini cut or things like this. But I think to be a mini cut, it needs to be four to six weeks in length. In reality, if you're going to be aggressive, you're going to be assertive and you really want to get that quick fat loss. I think four to six weeks is about as long <clears throat> as most mini cuts might run, maybe eight weeks. But if you're getting into kind of 12 weeks into two months plus, that's really kind of getting into a more of a just traditional diet phase. Uh, and the, the kind of the method behind the mini cut is, well, OK, it's short so that any of those diet fatigue factors, kind of the drop in metabolic rate, those sort of things that we see with progressive long diets that doesn't come into play. So when you come out of the mini cut, you're kind of in a healthy, really healthy state still. You're not kind of, you may even well be in a healthier state because you've lost that body fat. So you're in a good position after the diet. You're not kind of left needing to do kind of whatever and people might have like recovery diets, reverse diets, whatever it might be. There's no chance of kind of all of those kind of metabolic factors aren't included within that. So that's really good. And the other benefit to it is you kind of lose at a rate that's as maximal as can be for fat loss without potential muscle loss because there are other kind of fad quick fat loss diets or even something like Lyle McDonald's kind of got his approaches to quick fat loss. But some of those could potentially risk muscle loss or they could have a bigger impact on just your lifestyle in general. Whereas the mini car, at least the way I try and run it, it has as little impact on those aspects as possible. Um, so it's trying to get the kind of best of all worlds, but that does mean it's a limited period of time because if you try to extend it, the likelihood is you'd risk more muscle loss and you kind of see these diet fatigue factors really building up. So like uh, hunger would come up massively. You'd start kind of seeing your your energy levels really going down. Um, so yeah, in a, in a nutshell, it's kind of as quick fat loss as you can get um, for a short period of time. Right. So... Um, I mean, you you have guided some people through mini cuts and you have done mini cuts yourself. So the absolute longest one would be like six weeks. Is that correct? Yeah. So with the group coaching, that's a six week course. Um, so throughout that, they're, they're dieting throughout that entire time. I tend to run it for like a length of a mesocycle so that you can be training throughout it and then basically finish it with a deload and then you're off to your next mesocycle of training. And that's how I kind of periodize it in. Otherwise it gets a bit kind of wishy-washy if you try and kind of go through half another mesocycle mini cutting or trying to lose fat and then go into like a mass at the second half kind of things just get very difficult. So it's quite a nice kind of clean slate if you have it kind of four to six weeks, which is kind of what an average mesocycle might be. Um, and within that, the, the training is all set up for kind of, and we may come on to this more so, but that mesocycle is like a hypertrophy mesocycle. So it's being in the kind of hypertrophy typical uh, principles behind that. So we're trying to maximize 
muscle growth while in that calorie deficit because that's going to be our best tool to really retain as much muscle as possible when you're when you're guiding people through this like what is what what type of results are we talking about in terms like like what would be the maximal amount of weight loss that you would have seen in the past with people or with yourself so typically what i aim for um is around that one percent figure it might go up to kind of 1.5 even two percent maybe in the first few weeks but on average throughout the four to six weeks we'd be aiming for that one percent of total body weight loss per week so for myself if i started at like 180 pounds on average per week i'm looking for 1.8 pounds over the course of four to six weeks, that really adds up. Um, that's a lot of weight to lose. So if someone's like 200 pounds, that's like two pounds a week on average for the entire time. Whereas for females, again, it will be kind of, it'll move towards a smaller amount. If they're only kind of 120 pounds, that's a pound. So normally for most one to two pounds per week seems to be the ballpark it lands within, but I do like to scale it to the individual um, and also taking into account their body fat percentage. So when people sign up, for the mini cut, I get them to kind of tell me what sort of body fat percentage they think they are based off uh, images. And the leaner they are, the more we shoot maybe to the, the just below the 1% and the, the fatter they are, the higher we can go. So maybe up to the 1.5%, depending on kind of their lifestyle, what kind of calories they're maintaining on at the moment, because they might be kind of quite fat, they might be quite heavy, but they might be maintaining on relatively low calories because their lifestyle means they've got an office job. They can only train three times a week. And so I can't give them kind of uh, and a thousand calorie deficit, for example, might look to achieve that two pounds weight loss per week for that person. But if they're maintaining on like 2,500 calories, then they're going to really struggle to bring that down to 1,500. They might be able to, but it could be a struggle. So there's there's always the it always has to be individualized to the person. You can't kind of have a, a one size fits all like any diet. Yeah, absolutely. So, so let's go pro a little bit, or let's geek out a little bit on these uh, calorie deficits. So, for people who who want to set something up for themselves, who who just want to get ready for the beach, I mean, obviously, when you want to lose fat, the rule, the golden rule of thumb is always as quickly as possible and as slowly as necessary, right? So for people who, who you know, want to get get lean as quickly as possible, but don't want to obviously lose all the hard earned muscle, what is kind of the largest deficit that you would ever recommend someone in, in the kind of bodybuilding body fat percentage ranges? So maybe the high end of that would be 15, 16, maybe 17% body fat. So within those ranges, um, what is their largest deficit you would ever, ever, ever recommend someone to go under? So I find this really interesting because people like to have like a percentage deficit in their mind. And this is something I used to work on. I used to work on like a 30% calorie deficit. There'd been yeah. some good research on showing that even lean individuals could lose a lot of fat mass in a short period of time and retain muscle mass by that 30%. And I don't think that's a bad place to start, but I prefer to work it in a different way, which sometimes can come to the same answer. But if we just take, say me, for example, at 180 pounds, say I was like that 15% body fat. So I'm shooting for 1% of total body weight loss per week. So that's 1.8 pounds. So theoretically, kind of, we know 3,500 calories is around one pound of weight loss per week. So I just, and that's a 500 calorie deficit per day. So if I multiply 500 by 1.8, that should get me to the calorie deficit I need per day to lead to the 1.8 loss per the week. Um, so that's the way I normally work it out for the people who are signing up. Um, obviously, it's not 100% because when you reduce food, you lose the thermic effect of feeding. Again, people are going to get a bit more lazy potentially just because they're, <laughs> they're consuming less calories. So you don't get that equivocal loss um, but I think that normally works quite well and sometimes I'll just kind of give a bit of a buffer uh, depending on how many calories that's looking like because if it's getting really low again sometimes I just feel like that person might not be able to deal with such a large calorie deficit but that's how I normally would work out for people and I think that's a really kind of individualized and very kind of proper approach for most people to go about it yeah yeah I think that's that's a really good point actually and 
just in the point of just how going off of percentages is not always the best approach. I think also people, um, and I've done this countless times in the past where I just obsessed over knowing exactly how many calories I have to hit in a deficit only to realize that that actually like I just have to start off with a good estimate and then look at my progress and off of that determine whether it was like accurate or not. And I, I've just done this last week where I had an estimate and basically I just looked at the average of the past few weeks and off of that I calculated that I overestimated my energy expenditure basically. So I had to reduce. I don't expend 2,700 calories per day at rest. I only expend about 2,500 probably. So, so that that that's an important thing to keep in mind for people. And and the other thing is that um, I would be wondering when you're setting up a deficit, do you uh, distribute it across like okay, this um, this like portion of the deficit is coming from food reduction, and this is coming from cardio or extra activity, or how do you? like to do it so normally just to keep it simple for people within if it was in the group structure i normally just do it via the food and i tell them to keep their current cardio their current um yeah current cardio if they're doing any sports outside they can keep that level and then they've got a, the training program which is also provided within the group that they'll be doing as well and if there's any kind of they want to maybe do extra cardio or um they're they're kind of email me back and say that food looks quite low, then maybe there'd be a discussion of, okay, try and set a step count or increase and have some cardio there as well. But most of the time, I really find food a very effective way to get that calorie deficit because if you eat 100 calories less, you know you're having 100 calories less. You, you know that for certain. Whereas if you add 100 calories of cardio, you haven't net 100 calories there because that's time that you will still be burning calories. If you're sat on the sofa for, say, it takes you 15 minutes, you're still gonna be burning calories sat on the sofa. So you might only net maybe 70 of those calories. So it's kind of an inefficient way of doing it, just continuing adding cardio, especially when it gets into kind of lofty amounts because then people have been shown to just get lazy. And so their neat levels come down which is really gutting because you're finding you'll have to escalate your cardio more and more and more and you just get more and more lazy outside of it. So that's actually why I like having a combination of like a step count and cardio because steps are a good indicator of maybe how lazy you're getting. Um, that's definitely something that I've found with myself. One thing that I forgot to ask you is that, you know, as the saying goes, I think it's coming from Lyle McDonald, that no matter how much fat you're losing per week, you almost want it to be tw twice as fast. So let's say a lot of some people listening to this go, okay, I want to start dieting from 15%. And that 1% is a good ballpark to not risk too much muscle mass loss and still make good progress. Is there a benefit to potentially in terms of like, just simply uh, from the perspective of losing fat at a faster pace, to put yourself in a larger caloric deficit, potentially uh, risk a bit more muscle loss? but still potentially lose more fat. So at what point do you think that point comes where mathematically it's just not worth it anymore because the muscle to fat loss ratio is so bad that you would benefit from eating more food and losing less muscle and thereby more fat? I think the, the way people need to approach that sort of thought process is that muscle is so hard to gain comparatively to how hard fat is to lose. Fat can be lost quite simply. Um, you just get into a calorie deficit, it will go. Whereas muscle, to actually gain muscle when you're not a novice uh, is incredibly difficult. So if you're willing to kind of loss, I think you need to think about how hard it was to get that muscle. And that will hopefully put people off trying to approach it in too an aggressive a way. If they don't mind losing muscle, then that's fair enough. But I think you have to think about the actual kind of the, the actual cost is probably not worth the risk. And yeah, I mean, basically, I was just going to repeat what you, you were saying. But one thing that I still wanted to ask you, and I forgot, is that let's say someone has longer ways to go, like, let's say, realistically, to actually get to their end point, they will have to diet for 12 weeks plus. Do you think it would be a viable option to kickstart things with 
an approach like a mini cut and then transition into a slower approach? Yeah, I think it's that's actually one of the the, the key success things for a mini cut because it can be kind of a ignition for a longer cut. Um, I know there's been multiple kind of studies come out on this and I think everyone can just attest to the fact that when you get into a diet, it's really nice to have initial fast progress and I actually use this with quite a lot of clients who do want to cut quite a lot of fat. We get quite aggressive at the start so we really, really kind of get some really good results on the scale and they're very happy and they're loving the diet. Um, and that gets creates great buy-in. So they want to kind of continue and move forward. And then, yeah, taking a slightly less aggressive approach afterwards um, is, a, is a great way to go about it. And I mean, there's ways you can do that simply just by introducing potentially like a refeed day at maintenance that then reduces the calorie deficit you're in. It also gets you the potential benefit of the refeed if you wanted to have that, or you could just reduce the deficit in general. Or by that time you might've found, okay, you react really badly to a calorie deficit, you ramp your energy levels right down, which is gutting, so you're losing at a slower pace anyway. So it might just happen by default. But yeah, I think it definitely can act as a ramp for future kind of slower progressive fat loss for people. Yeah, and I mean, uh, just what you were, to piggyback on what you were just saying, I think everybody did, did that in the past where they calculated that, okay, I'm going to put myself in this much of a calorie deficit, and I'm going to lose fat in this amount of weeks to after, you know, like five days realize that, okay, I actually feel so bad that I just have to eat more food. So there goes the whole plan. So that's why it's, you know, you kind of have to adjust as you go. But I was actually just about to ask you, who is this strategy for? But that's kind of, that's a no brainer. It's for people who want to lose fat quickly. So I would rather ask the opposite question is like, what, type of population would you strongly discourage from actually using a mini cut or an aggressive fat loss strategy? Brilliant. Uh, no, that's a great question. And I think there, some of the prerequisites I have for people doing the, the mini cut is one of them is people who have already been dieting. I don't think a mini cut is uh, going to be a successful approach. So if you've already been, you're currently in a calorie deficit and you're looking like, oh, I want to just speed this up it's probably not going to work for you because you've already got multiple factors that have kind of started to build up. Your hunger's already higher. You're already ramping down your energy levels. Your metabolism's not in the kind of healthiest state. You're not in the healthiest state to start an aggressive fat loss phase. So I don't think it's for those people. And I also don't think it's for people who have just a history of lots of kind of periods of dieting and they haven't gone through like a prolonged period of maintenance or even like if they haven't had a decent surplus at all ever um, it's quite possible that they're not in the healthiest state to start a diet so they really have to be healthy before they start something like a mini cut so there's those people there's also the people that if they have a history of maybe binge eating or especially when they do aggressive dieting approaches it's not for them they need a more conservative more subtle approach um, because it is aggressive it is going to be hard uh, and if they find that having that sort of history creates binge eating patterns is not going to be for them. And then finally, people who are like 8% and below is probably not going to be a good approach for them because it just can't be that quick at that stage. And things just get so much more complicated when you're that lean in that just because stress levels and kind of water weight can really mask progress. And so something like a mini cut isn't really what you'll be doing at that stage. It's kind of a slower progressive approach. So those are probably the three populations I would say a mini cut isn't for. People who have had kind of a history of binge eating, who have been dieting or are dieting already for a long period of time, so aren't in a healthy state. And then finally, kind of the, the guys trying to get into a bodybuilding show or physique show. So generally, just people who aren't in a healthy state, you have to be really healthy to start an aggressive thing. Um, if it's not functioning like a like a kind of a car, you wouldn't take a car that was all beat up and banged up and try and drive it as max speed because it would probably break down and crash. Similarly to a human, if that human's not in a healthy state and you try and kind of drive them aggressively, they're going to crash and burn. It's not going to be a successful strategy. Yeah, no, I, I, I love that response. And, and just to give people some context, I mean, now you're preparing for for this contest that you're going to have. And I think I've heard you mention some something along the lines of, 
I mean, for the past year, you've been you you had like two short diets or something, so you you spent massively more time gaining and being well fed than actually dieting, right? Yeah, exactly. That's actually one of the populations I love it for are kind of people who are already in kind of a healthy body fat percentage and a good body fat percentage for gaining muscle, who then just use them very sparingly to get them back down nice and lean to then gain up again. And that's exactly what I use them for. And like you said, yeah, over the last three years, I've had two mini cuts, which have in total been like 12 weeks out of the, the three years. So um, that's definitely helped me be in a healthy state for this now contest prep. Right. Okay. So like out of 150 weeks, you dieted like 12 weeks, basically. Yeah. And, and is that kind of the, cause that, that's a question that is often get, gets asked is like, kind of what's the ratio of like being not dieted to dieted that you would recommend uh, to people generally, like four times as much being well fed or like what would be it? Yeah, I think four to one is a is a, a good standard approach to take uh, for most people. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so let's let's get into some of the nitty gritty. Um, and this will be very individual for people. I mean, some people do better on, on different macronutrient setups. But uh, when you're applying a more assertive approach, what kind of um, macro setups do you see working generally better so most people who come to work with me are coming from kind of they they resistance train already they're very active and generally kind of they do well with carbohydrates and so those are what we're using to fuel performance so i very much favor a higher carbohydrate approach so i basically set fats to what i see as a minimum so kind of 0.25 to 0.3 times their body weight in pounds um, for a lot of people that comes down to like 40 grams of, uh, fat to like 40 to 50, I normally give a range of 10 grams. Um, and then I will not that I set fat first, but that comes set first along with protein and with protein, I will tend to set that at one gram per pound as just a bit of a blanket because although it might not be necessary to have that much because one gram per kind of uh, pound of lean body mass would probably be sufficient. I do find that when it is such an aggressive diet, people do really well with a slightly higher protein intake because just the, the satiety it provides. So I tend to go one gram per pound is just like an easy uh, rule for most people. And then finally, I just fill up the rest of the calories with carbohydrates, which I really try and keep carbs as high as possible. Um, if I am dealing with someone who I, they, they've stated they have hunger issues, I might push protein a little higher. If they're a little like they're quite elderly, which I don't work with many people who are kind of pushing on the older years, I might push protein up a bit higher because they, they're not so efficient with their protein intake. But for most people who do the mini cut, they deal with one gram per pound really, really well. And then, yeah, like I said, set fats at 0.25 to 0.3 grams per pound and then let the rest come from carbohydrates to really fuel performance. Yeah, and, uh, and, and, and I think even for people who might generally favor higher fed diets, I think when you're in a steeper caloric deficit, I think that that's one time when most people kind of find the value of keeping fats lower for, for the simple reason that you can kind of max out on food volume more. And it, and if you keep fats pretty high during a, a lower calorie diet, then for your carb sources, you're pretty much or you have to resort to like green veggies and stuff like that, which are just not very good to fuel uh, training performance. Right. So. so no, exactly. I think if I wanted to maximize weight loss in this period of time, and I could definitely do that better via like a keto approach, which effectively that would be, um, because obviously you'll lose all that glycogen and the water that goes with that. But I don't think that's the best approach for maximizing muscle retention, uh, which is why carbs are biased. And yeah, like you said, I mean, you can have tons of veggies, food volumes way better with carbohydrates because the fact they're four. Uh, calories per gram versus nine and that just fat mm -hmm. suck when you're in a diet a lot of the time uh and and uh, speaking of speaking of food volume and uh stuff like that um what about food choices like do you educate people on that i mean you know for people who are kind of 
have a lot of um, routine or how do you say it, like who are experienced in that regard, they know that you're pretty much forced to be eating healthfully at this point. I mean, you can't really afford to fit in a lot of uh, junky stuff, but are there specific types of foods that you're discouraging people from consuming? Like I personally always advise people to stay away from oils and, and things like that because I mean, they just, you know, bl you blow your calories on volumeless stuff, basically. But so, yeah, definitely. Uh, the first thing I tell people when they're kind of going into this sort of a diet is to plan because so many people will just try and free ball it the next day, like starting the diet. And they're like, wow, I've blown my fat intake and it's just meal like one. They're just having breakfast and they had like a load of eggs and they've had butter with it. And so they've blown their fat macros. So I definitely give them the guideline. Okay, first of all, calories are king, then get your protein and then try and hit your, your fats and your carbs. And this is quite important because this is an aggressive approach. You need to be more calculated. You need to be more kind of controlled with it. Just like we use the car analogy again, the faster you drive a car, the better kind of driving you need to have, the more attention you need to pay to things. Um, otherwise, something could go amiss and just a slight kind of, if you just don't see something on the road, you could crash and burn. Same with the diet. You need to be more on point with everything. So if you can plan ahead, and this is always the first tip I give out to the people doing the mini cut, is plan a day, a diet ahead so that you can look at it and you can be like, that looks like something that will fill me up through the day. That will keep me satiated. And then follow that plan as best as possible. And as you get through the diet, you'll find you can kind of change it a little bit um, and find foods that really work for you. But yeah, I definitely, I refer them to, you know, Alan Aragon's kind of 80-20 get 80% of your foods from wholesome sources, 20% can come from these junkier sources. I also do say you don't have to get these junkier food sources because if you are really struggling, you were on an aggressive diet, you might just want to eat really nutritious food the entire time. And you might even find that having that sweet something puts you off track and you want to binge on it. Whereas some people find that little something actually keeps them on track. So I say just be open and honest about what sort of person you are because different people react differently to that. And then I give them information about kind of obviously fiber. We give, we set fiber goals and also kind of fruit and veg goals along with that. And hydration is also really key for this because if you're not well hydrated, that can be misinterpreted for hunger. That becomes really important. And then finally, kind of talking about the satiety index and different foods, is, foods on there, high volume foods, all of these sort of aspects are kind of ongoing tips throughout the process. Um, and we also touch on food environment tips because it is so aggressive that even just the fact you've got loads of maybe your bulking foods in the cupboards is putting you off and it's really going to kind of make it harder for you. So I give them advice about kind of putting them to the back of the cupboards. Don't put them in plain sight, put fruit and veggies out in plain sight, make those very easily available because the more you can make your environment kind of perfect for what you're trying to achieve, you can make it a lean kind of environment like Stefan Guillenay, I think, talks a lot about it, and I've got a lot from him. Um, it just makes the process so much easier on yourself um, because it can be really hard. Yeah, I mean, you know, everybody will have bad days, and uh, your environment is one of those things that can basically assure that you will be on track even on the bad days. So great point. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you about is uh, meal frequency. Do you do you advise people to adjust that when they're entering a deficit, maybe reduce it to uh, allow them for uh, kind of larger, more substantial meals? So it's definitely personal preference is always king. Um, because if they're gonna kind of, I might give them a meal frequency of like six, for example, and I might have said that's optimal. But if they hate eating that, or if their lifestyle doesn't allow for that because they're kind of working an office job and it's just not viable for them. Um, I don't set a given meal frequency. I have recommendations of normally three to five meals is what I like to see, um, but pick one that suits them and their kind of appetite and how they deal with things. Because like you said, if a female's coming and doing the mini cut and we put her on under 1,500 calories, which is very typical, then they're gonna struggle if they're splitting their meals into six. They're going to be not eating meals. They're eating snacks. Um, however, I do like to see protein split quite evenly through the day, at least three meals, just because we're trying to maximize muscle retention. If we want to maximize that, we need to maximize muscle protein synthesis, which is basically the growth of muscle. So if we can have kind of 
three meals spread through the day with their protein, that's going to be a good strategy rather than kind of having maybe an intermittent fasty approach or something like that. Some people do join and they want to take that approach, but I don't advise them to because that's not going to be the best, the most optimal way to retain muscle mass, which is what I'm trying to achieve. And they just have to know the costs and the risks involved because, I mean, intermittent fasting can work wonders for some people. So um, I definitely am not kind of completely set against something like that. Yeah. And uh, one thing that I always uh, advise for people and, and something that I always try to keep in mind for myself is that try to just partition more foods during times of the day when you're naturally hungrier. So, you know, like me personally, I'm cutting right now and I could always eat. I have a very healthily large appetite, but in the morning I could kind of just take it or, or leave it. So I, I literally have a shake and I kind of try to make it more satiating by diluting it with some hot water. So it kind of becomes like this hot chocolatey drink or well, it, banana flavor in this case. But, you know, it gives me the warmth, it fills my stomach up with something, but it doesn't provide you a whole bunch of calories, so I still have a bunch left to the evening. So, uh, just, uh, I guess this is something that people have to experience for themselves, right? Yeah, I think that is is a great tip in itself, actually putting food around the, the times that you feel most hungry. And yeah, there is, I give guidance in terms of kind of evening, because normally that's when people mostly struggle. I Again, it's a big one for me and stuff I found to help clients is to plan that evening meal. Um, but like you said, yeah, just dot in times which you know you're most hungry, identify those, that really helps. And I, I like that, it's, it's kind of like a bit of an intermittent fasty approach like protein fasting so you can get the benefit of having the protein but also the benefit of having kind of the larger meals later and that's something i use as well like year round is first thing in the morning i like to get the protein in i just have a protein shake and then the rest of the day and it's only kind of 100 calories and you yeah. get the benefit there and kind of then you can eat kind of in another five hours or whatever it might be like three to five hours is probably a good idea all right, so uh, food choices, I mean, obviously, you know, eat fibrous, high volume stuff, uh, fill your stomach up, but do you have any kind of weird recipes or weird <laughs> diet foods, diet food staples? I know you posted a pictures of the diet, dieting stack or something like that, or zero calorie foods, anything like that? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, um, I mean, that's when things get really freaky um, is when yeah. Walden Farms becomes something that you treasure and is tasty. And you, I mean, yeah. I've never taken it to restaurants, but I know people who have and do. And <laughs> that kind of, I don't want to get to that stage. I mean, I won't go and eat. I prefer not to eat out than have to take like a Walden Farm somewhere. Um, mm. But yeah, Walden Farms can be a lifesaver for some people. But I must say, foods like, so the sweeteners and stuff like that can be kind of a uh, double-edged sword in that, okay, you get the sweetness from the, the calorie-free source or kind of pretty much calorie-free, but does that sweetness then ignite things in your head that make you want more? And can you deal with not having more? Um, because that can lead people to want to kind of binge eat. Um, I, you have to know in yourself and trial it yourself um, but yeah, in general, for me, it's just loads of veggies. But I have had recipes where you use things like xanthan gum, um, and you can make like protein fluff, high volume can stuff you um, probably too much sometimes. Uh, I also I just do use my slow cooked oats a lot of the time. Um, but yeah, definitely I post in recipes quite frequently in the group. Um, I know my uh, fellow coach Pascal. He has just released a, a video on our YouTube channel called Pudding Oats, which he eats virtually every morning when he's dieting, um, which is like a ludicrous amount of oatmeal where he puts like some pudding powder, some protein and uh, some a lot of xanthan gum. Uh, but these sort of things can really help. What I must say is when people think of fiber, I think a lot of people then move towards maybe just high fiber foods, which could include things like uh, cereal bars, Quest bars. And they think that those are going to provide a lot of satiation. And I'm going to tell them they won't. Um, they're not going to be as satisfying as having the same amount from like a broccoli, chicken and broccoli, which provides the same kind of calories and fiber count as the, the small Quest bar, which is incredibly tasty and very dense compared to it. Um, so things that are going to fill your stomach, uh, they're going to be really important. So actually, I like to refer to the book um, and people might want to check out Volumetrics, which I think is a 
a really cool dieting approach where basically it's all focusing around like low calorie per bite food. So you eat the same food volume, uh, but you it's much fewer calories. Man, you're, you're bringing up things that, are, that I feel very strongly about. So actually, first of all, what, what are the macros on the that pudding oats and your slow cooked oat stuff? Oh, I actually don't know. Um, I'd have to refer to it, but I think it's around 500 calories for like a bowl that feels like a, a liter and a half, which is crazy. Oh, really? um, and my oats, I, I only use 40 grams of oats and I cook it with over 400 grams of liquid. So oh, the actual calorie counts like nothing, um, but it gives you a lot of food volume. And then I just, I normally have that twice a day. Um, but I, yeah, 40 grams, you can make into quite a lot. Yeah, and actually the protein fluff, that's something I'm, I'm looking forward to so much to trying it. And, and I just had a, a blender with a blender. It was, it was, I bought this blender in a store and it stopped working after 10 minutes. So it's like, that, that was a brilliant purchase. One thing, like you have to, you, you will become pretty creative during dieting. I just uh, realized that by putting lettuce in the freezer, that can actually work as a pretty good, like, it's almost like eating berries or something. You just put some sweetener and some stuff on it. And <laughs> it actually tastes pretty decent when it gets frozen. You don't no, need, I, uh, I can attest to, um, I literally today I was struggling with hunger, so, I purchased a lettuce and just put lettuce in a bowl with a tiny, sauce is a good one, but it is very tasty, very low calorie. You just ate a bowl of lettuce with salsa as like a snack. It's like 50 calories, stuffs your stomach. Very similar to like the protein mm -hmm. fluff type thing that will stuff your stomach. Um, yeah. 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 And, and, uh, just regarding the diet sodas, I've done a lot of experimentation on it in the past. And what I found is that. Uh, if you drink it between meals, so let's say your previous meal was like hours ago and you have like two hours until your next meal, having a, a diet Coke or something, that's, yeah, that's just going to make you hungrier. But if you drink it right before a meal or maybe during, that actually helps with satiety because it gives that extra stretch to your stomach, which is a signal for satiety. So, yeah, actually, that's yeah. It, also the good one on the diet beverages is some like something like coke will contain caffeine as well which can provide some satiation as well so that's really cool yeah yeah and uh speaking of caffeine uh what about what about supplements do you um do you have any kind of go-to supplements um i mean i know we talked about this in 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 the your facebook group but uh yeah what is your take on appetite suppressing or hunger management related supplements so yeah, I think I always start this with a fat loss supplement must be something that aids you to get into a calorie deficit because that's all it's going to do. It's never going to burn fat by default. Um, but I tend to, I'm really boring with supplements. I don't go anywhere kind of outside of kind of your basic health ones, which I think are really important. Um, I don't, I, and actually someone asked me today about your himbine. And I was just like, I just don't recommend it because I just don't think the risks of potentially kind of the increased anxiety, things like that, that can potentially come with it are worth it. And for me, caffeine's about the best one that you can get uh, that's risk-free for the most part, as long as you don't go crazy with it. And then I'd say just the best way, and, and we talked about this because I know you had a bit of a caffeine deload and I've done that myself. And you do get kind of, when you come off it and then use it when you need it, you get the, the focus it gives you is incredible, first of all. But I found that today I had it and I hadn't really had much coffee. And then the satiety you get from it's just much more powerful because you do become desensitized to both like every kind of positive, apart from like the health benefits of having caffeine because that has, or, or coffee because that has its own health benefits included. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a great point. And, uh, it's uh, if people are preparing to do a mini cut, then and you're currently eating a whole bunch of food, then it might be actually worth it to wait another week, keep eating a lot of food and quit caffeine for that period because you don't really need the appetite suppression in that period. And then when you go into an aggressive deficit, then that small amount of caffeine that you can ingest without risking uh, the development of tolerance and all that kind of stuff and becoming addicted, that will literally punch the hunger in the face so, so much that you will basically not feel hungry for a considerable portion of the day. 
uh, after ingesting it. So yeah, that's resensitizing yourself to caffeine is one of the best kind of fat loss hacks you can do. Um, yeah, it's, it's a tough process, um, but it is it's definitely worth it. And I'd say, I, well, I was never that bad. I've never gone too excessive, but I just do love the taste of coffee in general. So it's quite hard from just the, it becomes a bit of a kind of a go-to, like when you're out and about, like on the weekend, I used to have just a coffee to go and relax. And I just, I think it becomes a habit. I think once it's like any habit, once you kind of, at first it's hard to break, but after a while, it, yeah, like you said, it's definitely worth it. Yeah, yeah. And just, if you quit it, just prepare for the first three days. If you have been, if you've been drinking a lot of caffeine, like, you know, three, 400 milligrams a, a day, then the first couple of days will be hell. But after that, you're feeling fine. So ju just be, be prepared. Um, another, another thing that I mentioned in your Facebook group and some people might be interested is nicotine uh, in the form of, of, I've never tried patches, I only tried gums and that with caffeine in the morning, um, that's magic. Like the focus it gives you and the, the appetite suppression is, is amazing be responsible with it though like don't go over four to six milligrams is is kind of the the safe dose uh, within which you can consume it without developing addiction um so that might be something that people want to try I, I don't know if you've tried it yourself no I've actually, i remember you saying it now actually it's something i did want to look into because i think that could come in handy kind of in deep difficult stages but i would say for the most part if people just people need to diet longer um, and yeah. need to accept high fat loss to uh, hunger to an extent. And I think to quote Lyle McDonald, who we have quoted a few times, uh, suck it up. Um, that's kind <laughs> of just a good philosophy to have at times. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and I almost like when I get hungry during the day, then what, what I'm always telling myself, I'm not making this up, is like, okay, every minute that I'm spending now hungry, is one minute that I don't have to spend hungry at night when I want to go to sleep, which is for me the most important time of the day to be actually satiated. So yeah, you, you have to make friends with hunger to some extent, but and you will find out that it's really not that bad. Um, okay, one, one last thing that I want to ask you about is how do you uh, like to track fat loss? Do you use any other tool besides the scale? So personally with my clients, I use the scale along with uh, circumference measurements so just taken in like a few places around the body uh, I, I do find circumference measurements not to be so precise because there's quite a bit of human error that can happen and so I do find actually only tracking those every month to be probably most worthwhile just because the, the degree of error that could happen within a week could be enough to like completely throw it off whereas in a month hopefully there's been enough of a change to kind of get rid of the degree of error to an extent so yeah, I like body weight and, and average. So taking as many kind of daily weigh-ins as possible. So first thing in the morning, unclothed, before going to the loo, before eating, uh, oh, after going to the loo, sorry, and before eating, uh, keep that as standardized as possible and get your weekly average along with the circumference measurements probably every month, maybe every two weeks, depending, um, because maybe in the mini cup, that's probably worthwhile. Um, and then obviously photos, which I do like to get kind of depending on kind of the aggressiveness and normally that's every month, but I think those are all very important. And then just giving kind of people advice about kind of thinking about how, if people are telling them they're looking leaner, that's a good sign. If clothes are fitting kind of a bit better or they're like, then they're noticing that their waist, but they're using a smaller hole on their belt, for example, that's a really good sign. Um, those things are definitely things to track. And then also just take into account how you performing in the gym and how you feeling generally, um, because we don't want that to get too bad. Um, but that's not necessarily a predictor of that you're not losing fat, it just might be that things are taking it, taking their toll. But those are probably the only tools I tend to use. Um, and then the the images in their, in their own become like a body fat percentage kind of estimate, because then I just kind of look at that and I know what their whereabouts they're at rather than trying to do any kind of decks or anything expensive that might just be inaccurate anyway yeah yeah and, and actually one thing that I, I want to mention is that I never really used calipers apart from this dieting stint that I have currently and this is this is where I really see the value of, of actually using something like calipers because 
um, just like yourself, you mentioned in your podcast that you've, your weight has been weirdly stagnating at certain times, but you knew from experience that you were in a deficit. And similarly to me, this was probably the only time in my life when during a fat loss phase, I had a lot of water retention uh, because I've, I've been experimenting with all kinds of weird foods and psyllium husk and whatever, which is always a terrible idea for me. <laughs> and I, I've been retaining a lot of water. And so my weight has been very, very stagnant at various time points, but the calipers have been going down very, very steadily. So... Yeah, so so it's it's been very useful. So if people want to invest in in that, I would recommend an an electric caliper. I find the 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 manual ones are just I don't know, they just don't really work for me. Like it's uh, too, I guess it's too much of a dumb instrument to detect subtle changes as like millimeter on a millimeter scale. So so that's one thing I would say. Um, cool, Steve. I think we basically covered everything. Do you still have time to address a couple of questions that have been asked of us? Yeah, shoot. Let's go through some. That would be awesome. Cool. Uh, so b one question that has been repeated a couple of times was this idea of uh, cyclic caloric restriction or intermittent caloric restriction. So some days are much lower than others. Do you use anything like that with yourself or your clients? So I do tend to use that. Uh, initially, I give it as kind of a bit of an option. So if, wait, let me restart. So if people have a low training frequency, um, or if they've got kind of days at which they have much higher ex energy expenditures, I tend to bias those days to being slightly higher. Um, so there might be a slightly lower calorie deficit on those days if that person is dieting, or if that, I mean, whatever it might be, if they're massing, if they're maintaining, there might just be more calories on the days at which they are expending more. So if they're training three times a week, that might be something I consider. But if they're training anywhere from like four, five, or six times a week, then it's not something that I'm too concerned about because their actual overall energy intake doesn't differ that much day to day. And then I just give them kind of the helm and say, if you want to move 20% of your calories to one day, you can, and then take like say 10% from two days, absolutely fine. But if they want to move much more than that, I get a bit concerned that they're trying to kind of move towards a bit of a binging and purging cycle and I don't like calories to come too low on other days and what I would say is you've got to be sure to keep your protein high and stable throughout that always needs to be higher so it'd be more the carbohydrate would probably be what would be cycled for the most part um, but I don't tend to do it too much because most people I work with work in the like work out in the gym four times plus a week um, and most people like the ease of having the same calorie intake through the week and as far as I've had personal experience and with clients, that adhere, that's much easier to adhere to and that gets them better results than trying to do any kind of cyclical approach. Yeah, yeah. And, and just um, what, what I've noticed with myself, and I think I'm probably not alone with this, is that if you know that on your rest days, you have a much lower energy intake that can kind of compel you into taking on more training days that what is reasonable given your life context and stuff like that, which which can be a good thing sometimes, but it can also backfire quite badly. So um, next question was, how would you, and this is actually a good point, how would you end um, uh, a mini cut or an aggressive diet? Like in, let's say after that you're planning on gaining soon after, uh, would you just jump straight into the what you estimate to be your caloric surplus or maintenance or would you slowly reverse out how would you how would you do it so my views have kind of changed on this recently actually if i'm going to be completely open and honest about it um because when people first started the mini cut and the, the people who first did the kind of the initial groups they'll know that afterwards i advised them to go through a minimum of two weeks at maintenance and this was kind of a 90% estimate of what they predicted their maintenance to be. And I tended to use this off, say they lost a pound in that last week, then they're kind of in a maybe 500 calorie deficit. And so we just add kind of 500 calories or so to their intake. And then I just say, okay, maintain that for two weeks. And then you can go on to maybe more fat loss or something else like gaining uh, muscle. However, having kind of, spoken to more people, developed my own knowledge. It's actually a really good time to start massing so long as you are lean because you're in a very, very sensitive state 
to fat gain, but also muscle gain. And like I said before, kind of muscle is so hard to gain that I always like to bias it. So if we can make muscle gain easier by just entering a mass phase initially off the bat, then I like to do that. And similarly, it's just how much did you lose in that last week or over the last few weeks within the diet? Take that as an estimate of what your maintenance is. And then if you're massing, just add some more on top of that. So it might be around 300 calories, for example, is probably a good place to start. So if the person is in that kind of as a male, 10 percent around there or 12 percent, um, they can go straight into a mass, whereas say if and, and females add 10 percent on top of that. So if you're around 20 percent, um, you can probably go straight into kind of gaining some bulk. Um, but if you want to maintain beforehand, you can certainly do that as well. And what I'd add additionally to that is this is assuming you've just done this mini cut and your fatigue levels aren't hugely high. Say if this has been a bit of a prolonged fat loss phase and your fatigue levels are very high, you've kind of your training volumes got quite high, you feel very tired then probably better to go into a maintenance period, let that fatigue drop off before you try and go into kind of high volume, traditional hypertrophy training again. Right, brilliant, uh, great response. And I guess like one last question, I think we can knock this off quickly because uh, frankly, I, <laughs> I'm i not sure I have the sufficient like biochemical, whatever knowledge to answer this. And it's kind of a, a interesting question, but basically that some people say that for the first week of dieting, you're only, going through your glycogen stores and only after that you're starting to burn fat i mean i think experientially and intuitively everybody knows that that's false um i don't know if you have any thoughts thoughts on this one yeah i think uh, similar to you i'm not a researcher i don't i'm not kind of a i haven't got a, a degree in like biochemistry or anything like that so i can't tell you the insides and outs of this but what i can tell you is that one, someone like La McDonald, who has his like very aggressive fat loss approaches that last maybe what some of them are only a week long or two weeks long. People are losing fat and that he wouldn't advise people to do that um, if that wasn't happening. And also, like you said, you can experience fat loss within two weeks for sure. Like you can definitely see that. I think it's probably and where this kind of thought has come from is because people do lose glycogen and lose water and people are just attributing all of that to um the, the weight loss but there is some fat loss happening there it's just going to be a smaller component of that um that's definitely happening when you're in a calorie deficit you're for sure going to be losing some fat yeah i mean i guess sometimes there is a bit of a lag time between i'm sure you've noticed it as well when you go from a massive surplus to a dieting mode then there's kind of that momentum that still carries th carries through from the surplus where you're in a deficit technically but you're still kind of gaining fat from the from the previous period I've, I've noticed this a lot of times with myself but yeah it's it's hard to really tell how that works i mean this is why and we've spoken about it a little bit you have to take a bit of a longer term approach and also not always focus on the numbers and just kind of using your history and your data you kind of know okay i'm in a calorie deficit or i'm in a surplus because there are those delayed effects just like you could do loads of hard training and you don't see the strength gain until you let that fatigue dissipate. The same with some dieting, like you might not see the scale weight change until you've allowed that kind of chronic um, elevation of cortisol to dissipate and you lose weight, even though maybe, I mean, I've had people come out of a mini cut and continue to lose weight. They're not in a calorie deficit anymore. They're not actually necessarily like losing fat in that period of time but their scale weight's coming down because they're maybe clearing loads of water that's allowing that kind of whoosh to come through um cool man i basically kept you here for an hour and i uh, you're contest prepping so i don't want to maybe you potentially miss a meal or something like that i, I wouldn't want to risk that so um Thank, thank you so much for being here and just any kind of uh, stuff that you want to get people's attention to stuff that's coming out for you any kind of content resource anything like that that you want to plug or mention awesome no yeah um, i've actually got a pm session that i'm going to be hitting i've split my session to am and pm so oh, wow. I've got some bro isolation work to go and do um nice. but yes definitely probably i mean if they want to check out more about the mini cut movement, they can go to revivestronger.com. I advise them to go over there anyway because the podcast is on there, articles are on there, loads of free resources. But the main thing I'd probably want to plug, depending on when this comes out, and hopefully it comes out before kind of the end of May, but Mike Isretel, 
um, who hopefully a lot of your viewers will know is coming to the UK 27th and 28th of May. So if people are interested in seeing a conference surrounding kind of advanced muscle hypertrophy, which is what Mike's going to be going over, definitely check out revivestronger.com and look for that conference because we're starting to sell tickets very soon. It might be after this. They'll be probably on sale by the time this podcast comes out. But definitely check that out. And yeah, just go to the website, all the different kind of places I'm at, kind of Instagram, Facebook, and everything's on there. And yeah, thank you, Abel, for again having me on. I really appreciate it. All right, guys, Abel here again. Hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please subscribe on YouTube if you watched it there. I come out with new content every week there, whether it's in the form of a podcast episode like this, which I actually aim to do one off every week, or some shorter informational video. Also, if you could just leave a comment and suggest some people that you'd like me to interview or just topics you'd like me to cover, uh, it would be very helpful to know how I can better serve you. And if you listen to it in podcast, format if you could leave a rating on itunes it would greatly help out the show and i would be more than grateful for it so thanks guys for hanging out up until now thanks for being here and see you all next week